All right, it is one o'clock and time for us to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peggy Doty and I'm gonna be moderating for Dwayne today. We are gonna be hearing his webinar on soil, climate and carbon. And we have some people still trickling in. Please check and turn off all your audio and your mic, please, as it will help keep things clean for the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. So we ask that you continue to leave those turned off during the entire time. Um, it just, it makes a big difference in the presentation ability. Uh, this recording will be shared to the University of Illinois Extension's YouTube page. It may take a few weeks uh, once they've processed the closed captioning and you will receive an email letting you know when those are available if you wanna review the webinar at your leisure. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to use the chat box, which is in the center bottom of your screen. And you can place your questions there. We'll, we'll be asking those questions. We'll gather those as we go along. And I'll, I'll be keeping track of some of those uh, duplications. And we will say, have some time at the end to see how many of those we can get um, through uh, asking Dwayne to get his input on those. So if you will, I will be putting the YouTube uh, link in the chat, um, but it won't, again, it won't be ready for some time. So with... Uh, no further ado, I know Dwayne has lots to share with us today. Dwayne, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Peggy. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone. I know we'll probably still have a few people coming in. We actually had about uh, 270 that registered. So I know these days, a lot of people, since they know it's recorded, they'll just listen to it later, which is fine. But I do wanna welcome the folks that are online live today. I know we've got uh, a lot of people from Illinois, but we've also got some people from other states and we may have a couple from other countries. So welcome everyone. Hopefully you'll get uh, something that you're looking for out of this presentation. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started with this. Hopefully, there we go. So just wanna go through what we're gonna cover in today's session in the next 60, 55 to 60 minutes. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, and if you thought that this was going to be on carbon markets, uh, I'm afraid that's not the case. We're going to be talking more about carbon in the soil, uh, especially in the form of organic matter. So we're going to talk about the importance of that soil organic matter and its relationship to soil carbon. We're going to talk about some of the things that just happen naturally that affect organic matter. We're going to talk about how organic matter and carbon varies across the region just because of geographic variations. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the effects that humans have on organic matter in the soils. Then we'll talk a little bit about how we can increase soil organic matter. And along with that, look at some studies since carbon sequestration is a really hot topic right now. We'll talk a little bit about some long-term carbon storage studies and how that works. We'll also touch very briefly on climate projections for the Midwest. And I'll just be focusing mainly on the Midwest and Illinois. And then we'll talk about how all of this comes together in terms of uh, carbon sequestration, soil resilience, and all of those things. Now, if anybody's taken a introductory soils class, you probably have seen this before, but if we wanted to look at an ideal soil by volume, what we would like to see is not quite half of that volume, about 45% be made up of minerals. And most of those minerals would be plant nutrients that plants could use for their vitality. We'd want about a fourth of that volume be made up of water, about a fourth of that volume be made up of air or gases. And those gases are not gonna be the same ratio of gases that we have in the atmosphere, which in the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. We would not have the same ratio of that. We would have more carbon dioxide in the soil than we do in, in the atmosphere, but we would have those gases present. 
And then the remaining amount, about 5% would be organic matter. And especially here in the Midwest and uh, the Northern and uh, part of the Midwest in particular, we would have been very close to that ideal volume a couple hundred years ago. We would have, would have been a little bit high on the water side, a little bit low on the air side, but in terms of mineral content and organic matter content, we would have been very close to right on the mark. And you look at that 5% and you think, that's not a very big percentage. Why should we even be concerned about it? Organic matter is extremely important in soils. It provides a lot of the benefits for soil productivity. One of the things that happens is as organic matter slowly decomposes, it releases nutrients in the soil that live plants can take back up. Another thing that organic matter does is it helps make the soil, and one of the terms that's used uh, for this is it makes it more mellow. It makes the soil easier for plant roots to move through, makes it more easy for water to move through. Another benefit of organic matter is it allows that soil to hold water that plants can get to. Just because the soil has water in it doesn't mean all of that water is plant available, but the more organic matter you have in the soil, the more plant available water you're gonna have. And also because of the chemistry involved with organic matter, it helps hold nutrients in place. So for example, if you've got a soil that has a lot of organic matter in it and you fertilize that soil, it's gonna help hold that fertilizer in place and not let it leach below the root zone. One of the other benefits, and here we're talking about carbon, which is part of organic matter, but this is something that uh, Dr. Atul Jain from uh, our Atmospheric Sciences Department at the University of o Illinois has said that the other benefit of that organic matter slash carbon is that it acts as a moderator of temperature within soils. So it takes out those extreme hot temperatures and those extreme cold temperatures in the soil profile. Nationwide, when we look at the amount of organic matter in the United States and our soils, you can see the Midwest is kind of a bullseye for having high amounts of organic matter. Part of that is because of uh, those being relatively young soils because of ice ages and uh, the development of those soils. Others have to do with um, the parent material of the soils, climate, uh, but you can see the Midwest in particular has a really large amount of organic matter. So we have very productive soils in this area because of that. If we want to just look at Illinois, you can see that the state is kind of almost divided into a, a two-thirds, one-third type of thing. The northern two-thirds of the state has soils that are fairly high in organic matter, and we're going to see the reason why here in just a few more slides. And then the southern third of the state has lower amounts of organic matter. Now that's not to say that they are, uh, are very poor soils there. They're still good soils, they just don't have the amount of organic matter that uh, the northern two thirds does. So that relationship of carbon and organic matter, what are we talking about there? Well, since all living matter contains carbon, and I always think about the first Star Trek movie, if you're old enough to have ever seen that movie, which was many, many years ago, uh, the uh, thing that they came up with on that movie that they kept saying was that humans were carbon-based units which all organic matter, all living organisms have carbon in them. So when that organic matter gets into the soil, that carbon goes with it. And carbon makes up about 58% of soil organic matter. So some of the things that go into making soils what they are, and along with that, how that relates to organic matter. Some of the five natural factors that get involved with this are climate, in particular temperature and precipitation, what grows on that soil in terms of vegetation, what that soil was originally, the lay of the land, where we get into talking about drainage and erosion potential, and then time. All of those are things that come into play with making soils and organic matter in soils. For the climate factor, temperature has a big effect on the amount of organic matter within a soil. So, for example, if you can picture in your mind a lush tropical rainforest with all of this incredible amount of growth above the ground, warm temperatures all year long, how much organic matter do you think the soil itself would have? And you may think, well, with all this lush growth, it's got to have a lot of organic matter in the soil. Actually, it's just the opposite. 
there's almost no organic matter within the soil itself in those tropical locations. The reason is temperature. Because it's warm all year long, the microbes in the soil can quickly break down any organic matter that's there. And then that, those nutrients are released and they go right back up into the existing growth. That's why you don't see a lot of um, very productive farming going on along the equator in tropical areas because those soils really are not very productive for doing that. They do great for tropical forests, but they don't do well for growing other things because there's just almost no organic matter there. On the other hand, well, first of all, let's take a look at this. This is an example of a tropical soil. The way you can tell how much organic matter is in the soil is typically how dark that soil is because of the organic acids and tannins and those kind of things gives it that organic matter, that dark color. We well, can see in this picture, it's not present. Again, because those tropical soils are continuously allowed to break down that organic matter very quickly, it just doesn't have the opportunity to build up. On the other hand, when you look at cold climate soils, for example, you know, northern Minnesota, central Canada, where maybe the growing season is only one to two months long. You might think, well, that can't possibly build up a lot of organic matter because the growing season isn't very long. But the thing is, once those soil temperatures get below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, soil microbial activity shuts down. And so even though there's not a very long growing season, whatever organic matter gets into that soil is allowed to build up. And so typically the colder the climate, the more organic matter you're gonna see in those soils. When we look at vegetation, vegetation has a big impact on soil organic matter as well. <laughs> and if we look at the Midwest and Illinois, before this area started being used on wide scale farming, what type of vegetation was present in most of Illinois and throughout much of the Midwest? You're absolutely right, it was prairie. This is a map showing where prairie was at in the early 1800s in Illinois. All of that yellow that you see was where prairie was. Over 20 million acres of prairie in Illinois. How much of that do we have left today of undisturbed prairie? About a hundredth of a percent. So yeah, most of it is gone. Yeah, we are restoring prairie, but the original prairie is essentially gone. And if you notice, the east central part of the state had continuous prairie for miles and miles and miles. Part of that was because of the lay of the land, very flat in that area. And so that helped aid prairie. And the reason is, I'll, I'll show you in another slide or so. Now, some of you may grow prairie or you've seen prairie and you see that lush above ground growth. Some of it can get five, six, seven feet tall very impressive, but what's even more impressive is the root system of those plants. Very massive, very fibrous root systems. They ooze organic matter. Some of these can go down 15 feet. For example, we're showing here blazing star. star. That root system can go down almost 15 feet into the soil. Added huge amounts of organic matter. So when we look at our Midwest soils, the reason they have so much inherent organic matter in them, even today, we have to look back to those prairie plants and those massive fibrous root systems. That is what added the organic matter into those soils. And if you notice where we looked at before, when you see the uh, prairie there, you notice down in the southern third of the state, it was more forest. And that also helps explain why there's not as much organic matter there. Yes, trees have root systems, but they don't have the biomass. They don't have that huge, massive fibrous root system that prairie plants do. And like I say, these plants ooze organic matter. So not only do they decompose when they die out, but even while they're living, they're giving off organic matter. They're oozing it. And that organic matter that's being given off by that make up much more of that organic matter than the above ground growth. Because if you think about it, that above ground growth is just touching the very surface of the uh, uh, soil profile. So you've only got half of it in contact with the soil. So you don't really have very much of it that actually works itself into the soil in terms of organic matter and carbon. 
for those that, that do live in the Midwest, you know that we grow a lot of corn and you see those plants and you look at those root systems and you think, well, doesn't that add a lot of biomass to the soil? Well, they do add some, yes, but not nearly what prairie did. Prairie had over five times the amount of biomass as field corn does. Now, what happened to that prairie? Our climate has been wet enough for several thousand years to support trees. But why did we have prairie? Since prairie is more of a dry land system, part of it goes back to the lay of the land. Lots of the Midwest, very flat. You saw that in East Central Illinois, that area has very little drainage. So you have very flat areas that just go on and on and on. Prairie is something that requires fire to survive. And so these periodic fires came through suppressed the tree growth. That's why we had prairie over much of the state and over much of the Midwest. Not only was that a natural occurrence, and some of you may very well be aware of this, but it was also a managed landscape. It was used as a tool for food supply, for um, sometimes war, um, and sometimes to lure in animals uh, for later use or to fatten them up. So fire was very extensive. Not only that though, but fire was also used in forest areas. We had a very open forest canopy back in the 1800s when settlers first moved in. And part of that reason was because that was also a managed landscape. And the more fire resistant trees, such as oaks and hickories were the ones that survived and that suppressed the maples. So for adding that, that carbon from fire in there, how much of that goes into organic matter? Well, some of the studies show that uh, in some cases, it could amount to quite a bit of the amount of carbon slash organic matter that's in soils, anywhere from zero to 60%, depending on, again, the type of soil it is uh, and uh, multiple other factors. The other thing to know is this fire added carbon it's very stable. So in other words, <laughs> excuse me, it's going to stay in the soil and not decompose very quickly. It's going to stay in the soil for long, long periods of time. And some of you may have heard of down in South America, where they have the Terra Prieta, where they're finding more of these areas where back 500 years ago, um, they're not really sure of the, the whether this was planned or whether it just happened. But they find these areas where the tropical soils, and remember, they're very poor soils, but you have these areas where they have very high carbon content in them. And when they look at those areas, it's because fire, uh, the carbon from fires were in this area, and that carbon is still there, increasing the productivity of those soils. And they're also finding evidence that that's where a lot of uh, garden plants, food sustenance, were being grown as well. Now, as far as what type of material that soil forms out of, because again, soil is something that forms. It's not just there. We've had multiple ice ages in the Midwest and in Illinois. The last one only ended about 10,000 years ago. When we look at what was deposited, when those huge sheets of ice melted, within the ice, you had huge amounts of at that point, it was dirt, it was not soil, but you had huge amounts of dirt, rocks, all of that, when that ice melted, in some cases it just dropped where it had been in the ice. And so you would have this hodgepodge of rocks and dirt and stuff that soil formed out of. That's called glacial till. And it forms kind of a, a gently swaying topography. On top of that, something else was deposited. When you had this huge amount of meltwater going down the Illinois and the Mississippi River valleys in particular, you had huge amounts of sediment that was deposited. Very little vegetation present yet at that point. So the wind picked that material up. It's very fine material, kind of feels like flour. Blew those materials miles away from where it originated at. We talk about the dust storms in the 1930s that would pale in comparison to what was happening back 10,000 years ago across the Midwest. And that fine windblown material is called LUSS, L-O-E-S-S. -S. That's another material that our soils have formed out of. 
very high mineral content, very productive. The till, the material that was deposited directly from the ice, typically has a lot of clay particles in it. The windblown material has more silt size particles. So in other words, larger particles with the lust, but still both of those very productive. Now, when we talk about clay, a lot of times people just kind of use clay as a general term, but clay is just talking about the physical size of a part soil particle. An individual clay mineral is microscopic. You cannot see it unless you look under a microscope. It's that small. There are many different types of clay minerals out there. Each one of those have, has different chemistry involved with it. So depending on how much clay you have in the soil can also make a difference on how much carbon is going to be in that soil. So they provide on the surfaces of those clay minerals, they have electrical charges, depending on what type of clay it is. And so the amount and the type of clay will also make a difference then in how well that carbon is protected. Now for the time factor, typically the older a soil gets, the less productive it is. I know the older I get, the less productive I am. So it all works together. Our soils here in the Midwest are very young. Again, they're only about 10,000 years old, which in geologic terms, that's blink of an eye. Those soils are very young. Another reason why they're so productive. And the thing is, it takes a really long time for soils to form, hundreds of years, just to even form one inch of topsoil with that organic matter in it. And when that soil is disturbed, we have some changes take place in that soil. And I wanna preface this next part by saying, I am not saying that we have destroyed our soils. Our soils are still very productive here in the Midwest, but we have changed them. And we've changed them in multiple ways. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about an agricultural setting or a garden setting or a landscape setting, when you disturb that soil, you're typically going to have a loss of organic matter and along with it, carbon. How does that happen? Well, part of it occurs from excessive erosion. Now, erosion by itself is a natural process. Our soils here in Illinois and in the Midwest can afford to lose a certain amount of soil and still maintain their productivity. For example, our really good soils here in Illinois can afford to lose up to five tons of soil per acre per year and still maintain their productivity. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Five tons, but you spread that out over an acre. Take your thumb and forefinger, put it as close together as you can without touching. That would be about the thickness of five tons of soil spread out over an acre, very small. And that's on our best soils. Our poorer soils can only afford to lose about one. So you have that natural erosion, but when we talk about excessive erosion, we're talking about erosion that's two, three, four, or five times over that amount. The other thing that occurs is when you disturb a soil, a lot of times you're breaking up those soil aggregates into smaller pieces. So when you pick up a piece of soil and you think of it as one piece, you've got millions of individual soil particles that are glommed together. When you till that soil, you break up those aggregates and then that opens that up to additional degradation of that organic matter and carbon that had been protected in those aggregates. When you add oxygen into a soil, that allows the microbes in the soil to go crazy. The microbes that break organic material down are aerobic. So in other words, they need oxygen to function. The more oxygen you have in the soil, the more degradation those soil microbes can do and break down organic matter at a faster rate. And of course, the other thing is changes in vegetation, changing from what was once a prairie and a timber landscape to something else typically will cause a decrease in organic matter content also. And when we look at a, an urban setting, we look at a development that's starting up. You may have had, if it was a, a, a typical crop field originally, you may have had 12 to two feet of good topsoil there, that good dark soil, lots of organic matter. What's the first thing that happens to that? Gets shoved off to the side. Out of that foot and a half to two foot of topsoil, how much will be put back? Probably just a few inches, 
because that topsoil is very expensive and it's uh, uh, very lucrative to sell. The other thing that's happening is when you're looking at these soils and most people when they're moving into the houses, they don't see any of this. Uh, the, the degradation in terms of breaking up the aggregates uh, and all of those things have taken place long before people move in. On the ag side, we know we've disturbed our soils over the years. If you wanted to see what was going on 100 to 150 years ago, this is an example. We had to physically turn that soil over to prepare it to grow crop. How would you like to do that for 10 or 12 hours a day? No wonder that guy is so skinny. But that's what had to be done. We had, that was the technology available at the time. Now think about that. When we're turning that soil over, we're releasing the gases that were present in the soil. What are we adding back into the soil as we turn it over? Nitrogen and oxygen. Now by the 50s and 60s, we've gotten a little bit more mechanized, but we were still physically turning that soil over. So you're still adding lots of oxygen in there. And what did we say oxygen does in terms of uh, organic matter degradation and along with it, release of carbon? It lowers that amount. The other thing that would occur is now on this slide, you see it's relatively flat there. So we wouldn't have a, a lot of erosion taking place, but what if there's a little slope and you've got all this bare soil and you get a heavy rainfall? You could easily have, instead of just five tons of soil loss per year, you may have 20 to 30 tons of soil loss per acre per year. So in the mid 1980s, farmers started changing their tillage practices for the better. One of the things that's done today is called conservation tillage. And a lot of you may be familiar with this, but for those folks that aren't, I'll go ahead and explain what we're talking about here. So you can see, instead of completely turning that soil over, we're disturbing it, but we're leaving some of that residue on top of the soil. And since we're not disturbing the soil as much, we're not adding as much oxygen into it, so you don't have as much organic matter slash carbon degradation, leaving some of that residue on the surface when rain does hit it, uh, right, a raindrop hits a piece of residue, takes the energy out of it, decreases the amount of erosion taking place. So several benefits from doing that type of tillage. And in some cases, there is no tillage that's done. If you look over in the left-hand side, sometimes they just plant into what was left behind from last year's crop, which is called no-till. So even less disturbance, even less addition of oxygen, even less erosion. One of the other things that we've had to do with soils in the Midwest, if you remember at the very beginning when I talked about soil volume, I said we were a little bit high in the Midwest on the amount of water in our soils. And that's what water in the soil made it really almost impossible to farm the, some of these soils, especially in East Central Illinois in the early 1800s because it stayed wet for so long. And think about the mosquitoes and those types of things. So they had lots of uh, issues with that part of the state until some new technology came along. And this was actually initiated in the 1850s. And what you see here, again, some of you may be familiar with it, but if, if not, this is called tiling. So where you see that trench, that trench is down about uh, three to four feet down and it is sloped. So it is sloped down to where uh, you have a stream or a ditch. Inside that trench, Back in the 1800s, they would have used pieces of clay pipe and joining them together. Today, we use black plastic such as this. And if you look, you see little slits in that pipe, which allows water to get into it. But then it conveys that water down the slope to outlet at a stream or a ditch. So what you're doing is you're artificially lowering that seasonal water table to allow that top part of the soil to dry out so that it can be farmed. And this is done very extensively. We're still doing it today. This is a picture just from a few years ago of uh, some tiling that had just tile that had just been put in uh, right before this picture was taken. Now, the other part of that is when we take that water out of the top of the soil profile, it's got to be replaced by something. It's not just going to be a vacuum. So what's it going to be replaced by? Air out of the atmosphere, which contains nitrogen and oxygen. So with tiling, you're adding more oxygen into the soil in that upper reaches in that topsoil layer. And so that also 
adds to soil organic matter loss. And, and again, I want to say that, you know, these are practices that have to be done for farming to take place. So it's not something that's necessarily bad, but these are just the effects that something uh, is caused by. When we look at a typical conventional corn soybean production system, and this is from uh, uh, the Ag Research Service, uh, Jerry Hatfield, uh, on average from his studies, it shows that a typical corn soybean system would lose about a half a ton of carbon per year from that organic matter loss. And this has been shown time and time again with multiple studies around the world. From whatever you start out with, once tillage begins, you get a very rapid drop in organic matter. And that's again, very rapid over the first few decades. And then things start to level off a little bit. There's still a slow decline. And that slow decline will probably continue for decades more. And if you try to go back to a permanently uh, uh, planted perennials or something like that, it will start working its way back, but it will probably take many, many decades, if not longer, to get anywhere close to where it was originally. For this slide, and you can read through it, but basically, and I, I, as more and more research is being done, we're really beginning to focus more on the soil and that microbial interaction with roots and the fact that we want to try to keep that organic matter and that carbon in the soil as much as possible. And that's really, I think, in terms of um, ag technology and looking at soil health, I think the research on this is really going to go gangbusters for the next five or 10 years. So I, I really think that when we're looking at soil health, I think there's going to be lots of research in the next few years that's going to help us with this. And when you look at the soil in general, just like other parts of nature, you've got cycling that takes place, and that's going to occur with carbon as well. When you've got those root systems, the more simple compounds of the carbon that's there, the bacteria can break down very easily, release that material, goes back into existing plants. The harder stuff, the, the more complex molecules is going to take longer to decompose, but the microbes are going to work on those as well. And then some of that material does naturally just go up into the air as carbon dioxide. So you have that natural cycling that takes place. And we've talked about organic matter in a very general sense. And this isn't getting that much more detailed. We could get much more complex than this, but we don't, <laughs> excuse me, want to do that. But when we look at organic matter, it's made up of different fractions. A very small percentage of all that organic matter in the soil, and along with that carbon, is made up of actual living organisms. Anything from bacteria all the way up to groundhogs. So very small percentage of that is living. Then you have the fresh residue that hasn't started decomposition. And that could be root systems. Um, you know, if you till maybe some of that overturned residue, but again, very small percentage. Then the larger fractions, and these are really important. That organic matter that is actively decomposing makes up to about a third to a half of all organic matter in the soil. That's called the active fraction decomposes over the matter of a few days, weeks, or maybe a couple of years. And then you have a very stable fraction of organic matter. And you hear, you see this word humus. So sometimes we use humus again in a general sense with organic matter, but humus is very stable organic matter. And we're gonna see how long some of that sticks around here in just a little bit. Well, here we go right here. So that more easily decomposed organic matter and the carbon along with it, Again, just a few years for it to turn over. A kind of an easier intermediate type of organic matter may take a couple of decades. And then that very stable, long lasting organic matter and the organic carbon with it hangs around for hundreds, thousands, multiple thousands of years. Looking worldwide, this shows you where the soil carbon is at. Again, you can see the colder the climate, 
the more organic matter you have and hence the more soil carbon. So you can see that easily in the uh, colder climate areas. And you notice along the equator, although uh, when you look at Malaysia and uh, those areas, I think that's more because of volcanic activity and the soils, very productive soils in those areas. But overall, the colder climate areas are going to hold more carbon. When we look at all the carbon that's in the soil, from some of the research, the average age of this is thousands of years old, about 5,000 years old. And that's especially true for the deeper down you go. You go down about three feet, really old, multiple thousands of years. Even that stuff that's only a foot deep, that carbon is about a thousand years old. So it's very stable, the stuff that's still there. So how much carbon do we have in our soils here in the Midwest? Well, if we look at our average amount of uh, organic matter in our soils, which is somewhere around three to maybe 6%, we're looking at about 10,000 to 45,000 pounds per acre, approximately in the top half foot of soil. So that's quite a bit of carbon that's present. And again, just looking at what makes a difference in how that carbon is stored, microorganisms are the biggest driver of that. That interaction of that organic matter in that root system is what drives a lot of that carbon storage and that organic matter development. We talked about the clay content, the type and the amount of clay makes a big difference. How that land is used, vegetation, climate, topography, parent material, all of these things we've already talked about. But microorganisms, that soil biology is one of the biggest factors. So we've talked about how we've disturbed our soils and how the amount of organic matter and carbon has gone down. What can we do to try to store more carbon in there? Well, there's a couple of things that's being looked at. Changes in tillage, so in other words, decreasing the amount of active tillage that takes place. The use of cover crops, and we can talk about this not only in an ag setting, but in a garden setting as well. Converting land to perennial plants and managed drainage. So we'll talk a little bit about each one of these really quick. When we look at tillage, again, the low, less amount of tillage you do, the less disturbance, the less oxygen you're adding into that soil. And you can add, organic matter and carbon in very quickly in those upper layers of soil by doing that. And remember, not only just talking about, even if we're not talking about long-term storage of carbon, when we add that organic matter, we're providing many, many benefits to that soil in terms of its overall productivity. For cover crops, and those of you that may not be familiar with cover crops, here we're talking about um, putting something in so you have a living plant system for as long as you can in the growing season. The more you have an active root system in there, the more that soil microbiology can add organic matter into the soil. And there are some studies that show that cover cropping can increase that organic carbon and or organic matter in the near surface soils by upwards of 15%. And of course, this is going to be affected depending on where you're at, the growing season, how much organic carbon was in there to begin with. But those fine textured soils, those that have a lot of clay in it, are going to do a better job of holding that organic carbon and that organic matter in place if cover cropping is used. For example, I grew up on a farm that's sand. We can do cover cropping, but in terms of adding organic matter in there, it's not gonna add a whole lot to it, unfortunately, because it's a very coarse textured soil. This ag research study said that the organic carbon and that light fraction of organic matter were higher in soils with cover crop treatments, even if you don't add fertilizer, even if you're just doing it naturally, in both cases, whether you add fertilizer or not, their carbon and the light fraction of organic matter were higher in soils with the cover crop. And here's an example of what we're talking about with cover crops. This happens to be from a few years ago, uh, not too far from where I'm at, which is in Jacksonville, Illinois, which is the west central part of the state. But here we have two different types of cover crops here. The brownish colored plants are called tillage radishes. This picture was taken in November 
after the first couple of frosts, the tillage radish does not overwinter. So it was um, desiccated, it, was, it died out because it had already been below 32 degrees. But the green material is cereal rye. That is something that overwinters. So essentially, as long as that soil temperature is above 50 degrees, it's gonna have an active root system. If we look at perennial plants, again, you've got that system in there and we may not be talking specifically about uh, prairie plants, but anything that's a perennial crop uh, will also accumulate organic matter over time. It's not gonna be fast, but it will do that. And here's an example of prairie that's been put in. This actually happens to be on uh, the farm that I grew up on. A few years ago, uh, we converted it uh, to pollinator prairie through the Conservation Reserve Program. And so it's got flowers, it's got grasses in there. And um, actually just looking over the five year period that it's been in from soil test before the plant, before the planting was done uh, to just this uh, last spring when I took another set of soil samples, organic matter in those areas and those acres had increased by about 2%. Now, a lot of that's gonna be the root material in there, but uh, it was increasing organic matter. For managed drainage, here we're talking about not just allowing that tile to drain whenever it wants to, but looking at times of the year when you don't have to get into that field to, uh, to do tillage or to run equipment over it. So if you can do that, especially in the winter time when you're not gonna have equipment out there, as long as you can leave that water table up higher, you're not gonna have oxygen in that portion of the soil. You're not gonna have as fast a soil degradation or organic matter degradation. And here's a structure that would allow that to happen. Now, this is not gonna work in every field. Uh, it, it has to be a certain uh, slope um, to do this, but what it does, I don't know how well you can see it, but in the center of that structure are little boards. And those boards are placed in there. And then you can see the blue line there, as high as those boards are, that's as high as the water will go. If it goes higher, it'll go over the boards and then it'll drain out. In the springtime or during harvest, those boards are taken out and then the water can just drain through the pipe without any restrictions. What about long-term carbon sequestration? Can we store this carbon in the soil for long periods of time? Well, this is some um, information from Dr. Andrew Margano from uh, Department of uh, uh, Crop Sciences. I'm, I think it's crop sciences, forgive me if you're on and I, I said the wrong department, but uh, from University of Illinois. The thing to know with carbon is you can't just keep adding it and think it's just gonna go on forever. There's a, a limited, there's a point where equilibrium is gonna be reached. And again, it's gonna be a function of management. It's gonna be a function of what texture that soil is. It's gonna be a function of the natural climate. The other thing that comes into play, just to make sure that people understand it's just not a simple, uh, thing to look at, we also kind of have to look at the chemistry too, and we have to balance the carbon and the nitrogen. So like it says, it's a chips and salsa problem. You got to have enough to, to uh, do what you need to do, so you don't want to run out of salsa before you run out of chips, so to speak. Um, now, the other thing you may think about, well, you've got all this above ground residue after a crop. Don't, can't you till that in and add a lot of organic matter? Well, what you're doing is, remember, as you're turning that soil over, you're adding oxygen into the soil. Multiple studies show that that material has decomposed and has gone back up as carbon dioxide within a very short period of time. The other thing is that material is not really sequestered. It's not really yet able to be stored in the soil and it can actually become very quickly decomposed. So really until it gets attached to those soil particles, those clay particles in particular, it's not gonna stay in the soil. It's gonna get decomposed and go back up in the air as carbon dioxide. And it does. So again, that material will be lost from the soil. Now, having said that, when we look at deeper into the soil, there are some uh, experimental data that shows that if you can add some types of amendments uh, with this soluble root exudate, so in other words, uh, types of organic matter, 
that helps biotic um, the microbes uh, with soil aggregation. Um, that'll also help with carbon sto storage in lower parts below that topsoil layer. So this may be a point where we need to look at, instead of looking at that topsoil layer, it may be, and there may be more potential with looking at trying to store that carbon a little bit lower in that soil profile. And there's farms out there that are beginning to use different methods to try to increase their amount of carbon in, in soils and along with that organic matter. Sometimes these work, uh, but the other part of it is we have to look at just like any other business, you've got to look at the bottom line. Is that whatever they're doing going to help them in terms of their overall profit? Again, some, it doesn't work for everyone, but uh, in this particular study, it did show that uh, using those soil health processes uh, did see uh, better soils overall because of that. And how does climate play into all of this? We know that these really big rainfall events, these heavy two, three, four, five inch rainfall events have been in increasing over the last 20, 25 years. They're expected to continue to increase. Think about that in terms of erosion. Think about that in terms of uh, you know, infrastructure. Think about that in terms of, of overall soil health. Our growing season, is also expected to increase. So what that's saying is our soils are gonna be warmer for a longer period of time. So that warming of the soils and those longer growing seasons, those warmer soil temperatures above 50 degrees are expected to accelerate the amount of carbon loss because of that. So we've got to think about that as a um, uh, offset mechanism in terms of adding carbon into the soil. Not to say that we can't do it, but we have to add that into the equation. So overall, what we're looking at with this is if you're looking at wanting to have very stable carbon in the soil that's going to last for a really, really long period of time, that also takes a long period of time to get that accomplished. On the other hand, the short cycle carbon can be built up within a matter of a few years. It can be built up relatively quickly. But the other part of this is, even if that carbon isn't stored for long periods of time, you're really benefiting the soil by adding that organic matter and that carbon in there because you're gonna have better nutrient holding capability, you're gonna have better water holding capability, you're gonna have making that soil more mellow and easier to use for whatever it is you're wanting to use it for. So essentially you're increasing its resiliency. Again, for carbon sequestration, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're wanting to store it for long periods of time, um, you know, I think, I think there's still some more work that needs to be looked at for that. Um, but again, if you're increasing it, um, the thing to, to know is if you just do that for 5, 10, 15 years, even 20 years, if that soil gets disturbed, you're probably quickly going to lose all the gains that were made because it's gonna quickly decompose and go back up into the atmosphere. As in terms of, of use of prairies for carbon sequestration, um, you know, in our situation that worked for us, we're hoping that we can continue to do prairie um, for as long as possible, um, but that's not gonna work for every situation, but there may be some situations where that will work but the other part of that is wherever that prairie is put in, you have to realize that to keep that prairie vibrant, periodic fire has to be done. Prescribed fires have to be done. Otherwise, trees and shrubs are just going to take that area over. Okay, that is it. I wanted to show this one more time. And I understand that the, um, the address itself may not work very well, or that link may not work very well, but I, the... Uh, scan itself is working. So hopefully you can take a picture of that. I'll hold it up there for just a few more seconds. If you wanna take a picture of that with your uh, camera, so you'll have that. Do appreciate if you fill that out. Dwayne, I also added um, Aaron Senate and we added a link in the chat. Okay, perfect, thank you. So they can cut and paste. So You're all right, take the weekend off. 
and it's Aaron. She's always, <laughs> she's always the save the day. All right. Um, so yeah, um, I was just going to say the next webinar is planning pollinators for the fall, fall with Aaron Garrett. That's going to be on October 14th at 1 p.m. And there is the uh, registration link for that. Wonderful. And Dwayne, thank you so much. Yep. That's like, it, every time you clarify it, I think I remember it and know it. <laughs> <laughs> Then I hear it again. And uh, it again. Um, I'm looking through the chat. We had a few questions. If you can uh, stay on here and just let me sure. get back to the top here. So um, Bill had asked, he said, can you clarify the difference between total SOC versus rate of change or decomposition, i.e. Michigan State study states that maybe 13% of field biomass residue will stay for a length of time. And maybe you're doing that now already. Well, and yeah, that goes back to that, any of that crop residue um, mm -hmm. and that particular study, I hadn't seen it, but what it's saying is about a uh, little over 10% may hang around for some time instead mm -hmm. of going up in the air. But on the other hand, you're, you're looking at 87% that doesn't. Wow. Um, another question, uh, Doug asked, can you identify specific farming practices beyond cover crops that will increase carbon sequestration over time? Well, part of it goes to uh, the type of crop that goes in. Again, here in the Midwest, we're looking at mostly corn, soybeans. You know, if we, we could have an extended rotation where, um, which again, economics is gonna be the big driver on that, but there are some crops out there that have more extensive root systems, more, uh, you know, if you're looking at a, a small farms type of, of setting where you may get into specialty crops, some of those have more massive root systems longer rotations, if you can get into any type of, of crops that may be perennial, mm -hmm. that would also be a benefit. Okay. So Janet has a question I like here. Uh, is there a benefit for adjacent soil by making waterways potentially planted with prairie plants? Um, well, right next to it, yeah, there's going to be, I would think there would be some because those root systems are going to go out away from that waterway. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing from the, the soil conservation side, and I am uh, started my career with the Soil and Water District, my one concern with putting prairie into waterways is with that lush, thick growth, that tall growth, that's really going to slow the water down to the point where you may have, and you have this with grass, mm -hmm. with bluegrass as well, but you'll end up seeing that that waterway fills up with sediment because mm -hmm. it's slowed down, and that's that's what sediment does when water slows down. It's going to land in there. So you could end up with finding out that it starts eating out along the sides of that waterway quicker than you think it might simply because you're getting all that sediment trapped in there, especially at the upper reaches of it. So just something that you may need to think about if you do that. Sure. Interesting. That's a good point. And I was thinking picking the type of, you wouldn't want dry prairie plants, you know, you could actually, but then you're going to add a clogging situation. Mm -hmm. And depending um, if it's a bunch, if it's a bunch grass type of thing, then that water is mm -hmm. going to preferentially flow through there. So you may end up getting little rills and gullies in between the sure. plants until they get well established. Sounds like a good research project. Um, Joseph asks, which soil types are best for carbon storage? Um, well, again, it goes back to uh, the climate soil type. Uh, if you've got a soil that has a, a good amount of clay in it, and again, looking at the, the particular clay type, that's gonna be really good. A colder climate soil is gonna work well. Um, those are, are two of the big things that come into play with it. Mm -hmm. And like I say, on our farm where it's all sand, mm -hmm. we can add short-term <laughs> carbon to it, but it's not gonna hang around yeah. if it gets disturbed. Yeah, I know that sand bottom too, all too well. <laughs> um, uh, I'm moving through questions, but Joan did ask if you could back up to the QR code one more time. She'd prefer to yep. grab that. She missed it. There you go. Um, uh, let's see. Here's another. <laughs> they all came in at the end. So Kyle asks, is the high carbon soil content in the Malaysia area due to marsh water content in the soil rather than volcanic activity? converting palm production to releasing carbon? That's a very good question. I, I don't have the answer for that. I was just looking at that slide again this morning and I noticed that and I thought, hmm, but I didn't have time to do any research to find out why it's like that, so. Interesting, yeah. The volcanic activity adds a whole nother dimension when it comes to topography and 
um, <laughs> heat forces. Uh, let's see. I'm looking. It looks like we got all. There's some books that are being shared. Everyone, please look through the chat. If you want to sharing some book choices. Um, Bonnie asked, is there a maximum limit of organic matter for the healthiest soil? Well, like that one slide showed, yeah, there is a limit and it, it depends on the soil type. It depends on the texture and, and some other variables. But yeah, there are, you can't keep adding organic matter to the soil and think it's just going to continue to build up. There is a, just a natural limit, just like everything in nature. There's an equilibrium point that mm -hmm. would be reached where if you keep adding, it's just it's not going to you're going to see zero increase at that point. So again, it depends on the soil type, texture, all of those things. Fantastic. So I have a question I have to ask because um, I know you've you've done a little bit of this um, potentially as a as a project. So what could I do as a very I don't have acreage. I have a little half acre in a garden. What things could I do? What can a homeowner do to mitigate? on their own property to hang on other than don't till all your garden up. Clearly I've learned that today, right? Um, what, what can we do? Cover crops on our gardens? Can Absolutely. We, yep. You know, growing and more native plants, will that help? Now, all of those things would work. And yes, I've, I've done a little field study where you could do uh, cover crops. We did tillage radish and rye. We built, uh, just built a little handheld because that rye overwinters, what you want to do then is not Really, you can tear it up, you can kill it that way, but uh, what actually works a little bit better is using something called a crimper, where you lay that rye down. Once it's got its seed head out, mm -hmm. you lay that down with a crimper, and what you're doing is you're bending the stems to not allow water to go through it, and you're creating a surface mulch layer mm -hmm. with that rye. That mm -hmm. rye quickly dries out, and then you can plant into it, and that helps with weed control. It's not going to keep all the weeds from from growing out but you can use weed barriers in between the row mm -hmm. and, and cook the weeds uh, during the summertime for that um, and it it works uh, and, the, the and, and you're not going to have i was just going to say you're not going to have angels and butterflies over your head when you first try it it's probably going to take a little bit of experimentation but <laughs> if you're wanting to do it it can be done but the key is not to turn it over leave it right now okay. you're and you've, you're going to have to disturb the soil some when you plant but um you know, just minimizing it as much as possible. So we did it, uh, you know, organically with no chemicals, no tillage, uh, and using cover crops. Okay. One last question from Kyle. How concerned are you about the increased average U.S. temperature as it may affect the microbes being active to release the carbon? Is that a big factor in the all, overall prediction of climate variation modeling? That's, yeah, that's absolutely something that has to be included, which just goes to show how complex these climate models have to be. Mm -hmm. And, and the, uh, the one benefit of, as we go on, as our computing power increases, the more things that can be added and the smaller scale these cells, which is what they use to, to represent the atmosphere and the ground and the ocean, um, these cells that are used to interact with each other uh, so they can get more of these complex things involved and, and see what the end results are. But yes, it's, it is something that has to be part of the equation. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, we're at time. Thank you, everybody. Please look at the chat. Erin has shared the link for the planning for pollinators next month. And we will be back at that time to see all of you, hopefully. And Dwayne, thank you for continually educating us um, and helping us understand the complexities of all the things we're trying to do or want to do. We appreciate your time greatly. Well, thank you. And I don't have the, the slide to show it, but if anybody wants to contact me via email, my email address is friend, F-R-I-E-N-D, at illinois.edu. That's perfect. Thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful day.